good morning, good afternoon, or good evening whenever your church is meeting personally or uh, virtually online. My name is Dana Allen. I'm the Synod Executive for ECO. Uh, your denomination, we are a covenant order of evangelical Presbyterians, and it's a great privilege that I have to be able to serve in this role with our over 400 churches and church plants spread across 22 presbyteries uh, across the United States. And one of the things that I love to do so much uh, in my role is to be able to visit congregations, to be able to participate in worship, to, to preach, or just simply to see the great things that God is doing in the midst of our various congregations. Uh, obviously, I have not been able to do that to the extent that I normally would in uh, the midst of this season because of a little thing that you may have heard of called COVID. Uh, and I say little because the actual diameter of the virus particle is 100 nanometers. Now, a nanometer is one one billionth of a meter. And so this infinitesimally small virus has brought the world to its knees. It's estimated by the time that you are, are watching this message that the virus will have claimed the lives of two million people across the world, 400,000 of which should be in the United States. And it is estimated that there will be years before we really know the financial and the psychological impact that it will have upon our own society and upon our world. And you take all that we have uh, experienced in the midst of this virus and you compound upon that the enormously politically divisive tensions that we have faced and the conversations and the tensions around racial justice and reconciliation issues. You put all these things together and you have 2020. Now I'm shooting this in December, but my guess is that even when the calendar flips to January 1st, we will not have seen dramatic changes just because we have a new calendar year. And all these things have taken their toll upon us. Some of you have probably had the virus and have recovered. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you have lost income and jobs. There is a tremendous rise of depression and anxiety. It is estimated that there's a 300% increase in clinically diagnosed depression uh, within the United States in these last nine months. We know that it's taking a toll on our churches and on our pastors. Most pastors that I know have never worked harder than they're working right now to make the appropriate adjustments and pivots in ministry. And yet it's increasingly difficult to know what kind of positive impact ministries are having on the people. But it's very easy to tell who's angry and who's upset and who's second guessing every decision made by the pastor or the leadership of the church. And all of that is taking its toll upon us. And so when I thought about uh, this Sunday, and I thought about a text that might speak into our present circumstance, the, the text that came to mind rather quickly was from Ezekiel chapter 37. And you probably know this text, it's the valley of dry bones that the Lord brings in new life. And so hear the word of the Lord in Ezekiel chapter 37. Verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me um, around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered him, O Lord, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and I will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, and bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them. 
and the flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slains that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. And so as we look at this passage, we want to be able to understand a little bit of its background. As you may know, uh, throughout the beginning of the Old Testament, God has been at work giving promises to what will be his people Israel that he will place them into their land, a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And so we see in Moses when he leads the people out of captivity in Egypt toward the promised land. And we see it when Joshua takes over and leads and eventually conquers and God places them into the land of Israel. And when the people inhabit the land, they are exceedingly happy. They're so grateful to be in this new land. But they also become complacent. They also become a little bit disobedient to the Lord. And so what happens is in about 720 BC, because of the northern ten tribes of Israel, because of their disobedience, God allows them to be conquered by the Assyrians and they are exiled, and they are held in captivity. And about 120 years later, in the southern part of Israel, they also have become disobedient to the Lord. And the Lord allows them to be conquered by the Babylonians. And it's about 20 years after this conquest that Ezekiel comes on the scene. And for Ezekiel, this is important because 20 years have gone by, enough time where, where the people of Israel probably wondered, we've blown it. There is no way we are ever going to inhabit the land again. We've messed up. God is going to renege on his promises because we have reneged on our promises and our covenants with him. And so God calls Ezekiel and he takes Ezekiel on this field trip. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I loved field trips. I loved in elementary school when we got on the buses and were to go to someplace new and it was different than the ordinary routine of what would happen in school. Uh, and Ezekiel has already been taken on two field trips. Back in chapter 3, uh, Ezekiel was led by the Lord and he saw the glory of the Lord. And it was so powerful and it was so great that Ezekiel was rendered unable to speak for five years. And then in chapters 8 through 11, the Spirit of the Lord, like the ghost of Christmas past, takes Ezekiel to show him the atrocities that were committed in the temple, that were done by the, the, the disobedience of the southern kingdom of Israel and that is what has led them into this place of captivity today. And so Ezekiel now gets to go on one more field trip. What's it going to be like? And God places him in the midst of a valley. And he leads him around this valley and it's full of bones. And Ezekiel notices a couple things. He notices, first of all, that there's a great quantity of bones. It just lays upon the surface of the whole valley. But he also sees the quality of these bones, that these bones are dry. They're not just dry, they're very dry. They're not just dry like my grandmother's Thanksgiving turkey, that you could still choke down as long as you had 
enough gravy to go along with it. No, it's dry like when my dog takes a hold of a rib bone and just begins to pull all of the fibers of the flesh off of it, all of the cartilage off of the ends, and the bone sits in the sun and it ends up getting dried from the inside out. That's what's going on here. There's a lot of dry, very dry bones. And later in the passage, God tells Ezekiel that these bones are symbolic for the whole household of Israel and what God is going to do to them. And I love as God leads Ezekiel around, he asks Ezekiel the question, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? And I love Ezekiel's answer in verse 3 when he says, Oh God, you know. Right? What kind of passive answer is that? It doesn't sound very confident to me. I mean, this is a guy who has seen the glory of the Lord, has been rendered unable to speak for five years because of the glory of the Lord. And God asks him now, do you believe that I have a power, the power to make these bones live again? And Ezekiel goes, you know, Lord. A little bit of hesitation. I mean, these bones are pretty dry. They're they're in bad shape. See, I think we too are living in a season of dry bones. Many of us are personally dry. We're worn out from the difficulties that has been brought out by this season. We're tired. We're fatigued. We, we see the uh, negativity on social media and all of those things that, that come our way and it's just taking and sucking the life out of us. We're fatigued, we're anxious, we may even be spiritually dry. I think one of the things that many pastors have noticed in this season is that without church programs and, and the, the regular rhythms of church, people become, have become so dependent upon the church as an institution to uh, feed their spiritual lives that when they're separated from that, they're not doing the things that they would normally do or should be doing to nurture that new life and the spiritual life within them. Our churches, too, unfortunately, are sometimes dry. And it's one of the saddest things that I have seen in this season that breaks my heart is when I see churches fighting and the the political polarization that has taken place comes and seeps its way into the church and that the church that should be a place that restores and keeps the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace becomes a place that sucks people dry. And it breaks my heart when I see that. I was talking to one pastor who said, I was yelled at twice yesterday. I was yelled at the first time because someone accused me of capitulating to the government because we were not opening up worship fully with full capacity and that I was worshiping the government more than I was worshiping Jesus. And then later I was yelled at that we were part of the virus problem because we had four students meeting outside Uh, physically distanced with masks having bible study and yet we were part of the problem of spreading the virus he says i can't win and i know people have felt like they can't win in the midst of conversations about race and i know these are hard and challenging things but if if we do not engage in this as evangelicals then we will abdicate conversations about racial reconciliation and justice to the progressive wing of the church and not ensure that we have fully biblical solutions. And I believe that Jesus is the one who breaks down the dividing wall of hostility and he calls the church to be agents of reconciliation in this time. And we cannot do it if we're fighting and angry and have anxious feelings toward one another. We're dry in our country. In 2019, obviously before COVID, there were two reports that were put out. The first was by Gallup that said that U.S. church membership was down sharply in the last two decades. The other one was done by Pew Research and it says that in the United States, the decline of Christianity continues at a rapid pace. 
Now, I know that COVID has uh, illuminated some people's desire to speak, to seek out answers to questions of faith, which is a great thing, but I think there's also been some leading towards spiritual dryness. As the Barna Group put out, they said 20% of normal church-going Americans have not been to church online or in present uh, or in person for uh, about 20% of them have not done so since the pandemic started. And while attending church certainly is not the end all of our spiritual lives, it's, it is a disturbing trend that we're seeing this occur. Our country needs spiritual life. We, I would say, are in many ways like that valley of dry bones. Can these bones live again? And I have to admit, I'm a pretty optimistic guy most of the time, and I believe fully in the power of God, but sometimes as I look at our country and as I see the divisiveness and polarization, and I see all the ways that this has taken place in the last year especially, if God asked me, can these bones live, I might look at him and go, oh Lord, you know. And Lord, I believe you have the power to do it, but it just seems like we're going further and further in the wrong direction. And so here's what I love about what God does with Ezekiel. Even though Ezekiel uh, might be a little bit fearful and a little bit nervous and unsure if God can bring new life to these bones, he calls Ezekiel to continue to preach. Ezekiel, I want you to preach to the dry bones. Even though you may not fully know what the outcome is going to be, I want you to trust me and I want you to preach. And Ezekiel did, he says, as the Lord commanded. And a great thing began to happen. The bones began to rattle. And tendons began to affix themselves to the bones. And it began to fix, affix the bones to each other. And as the skeleton was formed, so flesh came upon that skeleton. And skin came upon that skeleton. And yet lest these uh, corpses become a second helping for the vultures. God tells Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy to the breath, that breath would enter into these slain. And just as the Lord breathed life into the nostrils of Adam in creation, so the Lord breathed life into these slain corpses. And they came to their feet, and there was an army, and not just any old army, an exceedingly great army army. Wow, what a field trip. But God says to Ezekiel, lest you think I'm doing this just to show you my power, this is an illustration of what I am going to do in the whole household of Israel. I'm going to do the hard work, basically says the Lord, but Ezekiel, I want you to participate. God is the one who brought new life into these dry bones, but he called Ezekiel to participate in this task. And that is consistent with the character and the way that God works throughout Scripture. When Moses is leading the people out of uh, Egypt and they come to the Red Sea, God has to do the great work of parting the Red Sea, but he tells Moses, Moses, I need you to hold out your staff. This simple gesture of faithfulness to let God do the amazing work. When Joshua gets to the fortified city of Jericho, God says, I'm going to be the one who's going to bring down the walls of Jericho, but Joshua, I want you to march around it in a sign of obedience and blow your trumpets and you will watch me crumble these walls. And so throughout the scripture, God says, we need to preach, we need to share the good news, and God will be the one who will bring new life into dead bones. Praise be to God. Can God do it? Yes. And God calls us to participate. And so there's simply two things I want to encourage you to do. Is first, how can you speak new life into those within your church family? All accounts that I see are indicating that we're going to come out of the worst part of this in in May-ish, 
maybe a little before, maybe a little bit after, but we'll begin to have that herd immunity and we'll be able to do new things again. But I think in these next several months for our churches, we need to allow God to reconnect us. We need to speak new life. We need to preach the gospel to one another. See, the people that need to hear the gospel aren't just those who aren't Christian. They're all of us. I need to be continually reminded that my identity is not based in what I do, but in who I am in Jesus. And I need to be reminded of that. Our churches are are oftentimes fragmented and we need to allow the Lord to attach the tendons and reattach our bodies. And so where do you need to seek reconciliation with brothers and sisters within your own body? Where do you need restoration? How can the Lord strengthen our churches in the midst of this time so we're ready for that next season? Speak the good news to one another. The only way we will see revival in our communities and in our countries is if our churches are made strong and and built up in the Lord. And the second thing is what can you do in order to bring new life into your community? In ECO, we have a vision. It's our 2030 vision. And the way we phrase it is that we want to take the best of our Presbyterian and Reformed heritage. We have a great heritage where God has worked through Presbyterians and worked through people of Reformed faith to bring uh, new life and to send missionaries around the world to be able to create educational institutions and hospitals and influence society. And we need to do that differently in a postmodern culture. So how can we take the best of our history and saturate our broken and hurting world with the love of Jesus Christ. And when we talk about this vision, we imagine that our churches are like dandelions and that the Spirit of God uh, blows us by his wind, scatters us into our communities to plant the good news and so that we need to see within our churches hundreds of thousands of people who are equipped with the gospel to take it into whatever place Neighborhood, work, school, uh, community activities, wherever God has placed you, how can you bring the good news into that? And so I encourage you to go onto our website, eco-press.org. I encourage you to sign up for our our newsletters, our uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram. I don't think we're ever going to get a TikTok, but who knows, maybe. We don't have one now. Sign up for those things. To, we won't bombard you with communication, but you are going to hear the ways in which the denomination can work with your church and you to be able to be equipped to take what we often call your flourishing next step. The next step that you need to take in order to grow as a disciple and to be his agent in the world. And if you look at our website and you, you look at ways that you can invest in the future, you'll see that we have uh, some opportunities for churches to be involved, but also to equip individuals. That we have seminary classes that you can audit for $25 a course. That we have commission lay pastor training, and you don't need to actually be a commission lay pastor out of it, but you can be. But we have this, this wonderful training to have you be even more equipped to serve in and through your church. We have this commission lay pastor training that's uh, starting in Spanish too. We have a new Spanish cohort that um, is starting, which is exciting to see. We have uh, training to help you lead missional communities that are going to reach people who won't walk into the front door of your church. We have ways you can also invest financially in some of the larger projects that we are undertaking, like creating a school of ministry and uh, investing in uh, church planting that will see our ministry and our movement prosper and flourish. And so I encourage you to to look there, to look at ways that God may be calling you to continue to grow in order for you to bring new life into the dead places of communities and all. And I believe the Lord can do it. I do. If the Lord asked me, can God bring new life to dead bones, I would say, And he will. But he calls us to participate with him. He calls us to preach the good news to one another and to our world and to let God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for the privilege of letting me serve 
you in this role, and I pray for you individually and for your church as you seek to flourish and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, I do thank you that you are the one who brings new life to the dead. And that, God, out of your grace and mercy and love, you call us to participate with you in that work. And so I pray for every single person who is listening today that, Lord, if there are ways in which they need new life, that they would find that from your spirit, that you would build them up, that you would restore them, that you would nourish them, that you would allow them to build one another up within the church, that, Lord, we know that we're only going to be as effective in our community as you reestablish us, as you bind us together, as we live out that unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And so I pray for our churches that are seeing um, struggles and internal strife, that you would redirect that energy to see a movement of your kingdom come. And Lord, I pray for our communities, for our country, for our world, that we look out and we see a lot of dryness. And yet, Lord, we know that you can cause that dryness to come back to life if we will participate with you, if we will partner with you in your redemptive work in the world. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.